So welcome to 5782, my friends. What a bracha. 5782. We're going to make this an amazing year with everybody's help. This is going to be a great year. We love you, 5782. We're off to a great start. We're studying Torah together. What, what could be better than studying Torah together as a holy community of studying Torah? It's just amazing. So I'm going to talk about, that's really what I want to talk to you about tonight, is the importance of studying Torah. I, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I like to talk about uh, on Shabbat Shuvah, the things that are most on my mind. And that's an area where I think our community has been doing really well, but we can improve. And we need to talk about why we should study Torah, what we can get out of it, how we can up our game with the study of Torah. That's basically, that's basically what I want to talk about tonight, the importance of all of us studying Torah. So if you, if somebody says to you, what did the rabbi talk about? What did Shmuel mention? Say, he wants us to study more Torah. Say, okay, that's like, there's nothing controversial about that. Sorry, you're right. Nothing controversial about that. We're not trying to be controversial. I'm just trying to remind everybody that life is short. So we have to take every second that we have and use it for a productive purpose. And one of the most productive things we can do in our life is study Torah because it will impact our life for good and it'll impact the lives of those of us around us for good. So I have uh, just two stories tonight. The first story I want to start with um, is a story. Both stories have to do with rebelling Melech. I want to start with a story and then I'll end with a story. And I'll take questions at the end also or in the middle whenever you want to ask. So one time, this is a story about rebelling Melech. I got it. I, I saw the story in the book, The Holy Brothers, about rebelling Melech and Rav Zusha. Rebelli Melch went to visit his Chavusa, Rev Shmuel Shmelka of Nicholsburg. So he's visiting Rev Shmelka of Nicholsburg, and he and he came to the town, of course. He goes straight to the base medrash. They say about Rebelli Melch, and he went straight to the base medrash to, to search for uh, to, to search for Rev Shmelka. Now in the base medrash, when, when Rebelli Melch got to the base medrash, he didn't find Rev Shmelka. Do you know what he found in the base medrash? He found Rev Shmelka's student in the base medrash. Who did he find? He found Rav Mordechai Benet. Rav Mordechai Benet, the student of Rav Shmelka, and he sees him in the Beis Medrash. And Rav Mordechai was a very, very serious student, a very serious student. He was so serious that he actually maybe was not going down the right path because Rav Elimel looked at Rav Mordechai's body and he saw that what Rav Mordechai was doing was he was actually hurting himself. He was intentionally afflicting his body. He thought that this would make him a holier Jew. So he was putting, he was afflicting himself. Yeah, there were people who were doing this. And Rabbi Melch was very upset about this. He was very upset when he saw him doing this. And he said, he said to him, he spoke in a manner that was not characteristic of the holy Rebelli Melech. He said to him, stop your evil path. Do tshuva from your wicked ways. That's what he said to him. He said, you're, this is a wicked path. Don't go down it. If you do tshuva, if you stop doing this, Hashem will be with you. So when Mordechai heard this, He's very upset. The holy rebelli Melech came to Mordechai and told him he was acting in a wicked manner. And he went to uh, his Rebbe, Rav Shmelka. In those days, the rabbi said it to you straight. Not like today, you know, like the rabbis are afraid to sometimes tell people what they think. In those days, the rabbi said it straight. So uh, Rav Shmelka said, if Rebelli Melech said this to you, listen to him. He's telling you you're doing something wrong. He says, because you're a tzaddik. He says, Rav Mordechai, you're a tzaddik in many of your ways but not in all of your ways. And this is a mistake that you're making. He says, uh, the obligation of a chassid is not to torture your body and separate yourself from life. That's not what a chassid is. Chassid is not to torture your body, but to penetrate into the depths of life, to eat, to drink, to find within the pleasure of material life, spiritual enjoyment and sparks of holiness. So do you think when Mordechai listened to Rebelli Melech? What do we think? Yay, no. So from then on, they say about Rav Mordechai that he stopped, he stopped intentionally afflicting himself. Okay, he stopped doing that. But nevertheless, throughout his life, he would have been himself to a very, very sparse diet. And, and when he died, they found in Rav Mordechai's sitter uh, a, a note in his handwriting. And the note said, I hereby promise to Hashem Yisbarach that I will not enjoy things of this world 
other than what is absolutely necessary for my physical health. So Rav Mordechai, he stopped hurting himself, but he wasn't ready to, um, to actually take on all the pleasures. He wasn't ready to, let's say, enjoy the fine dining that many of us are accustomed to. He didn't partake in the Kiddush. He was just, you know, eating the bread with salt and that's it. You know, there's a very long standing debate and across different religions, not just in the Jewish people, but for sure, I only like to talk about the Jewish faith because that's the only one I have any competence in at all. And there's a long-standing debate within the Jewish religion about those who are striving to reach greater spiritual heights, which everybody on this, on this call tonight is, or else you wouldn't be on it. So you're only on it because you're striving to reach greater spiritual heights. And the basic question comes down to is what's the best way to come closer to Hashem? Is it by denying ourselves physical pleasures or should we use, and this is one of the, what Rabbi Elimach was saying, we should use the physical pleasures as a way of appreciating Hashem's world and thereby coming closer to Hashem. So, so this Hasidic story, this reflects this tension between Rabbi Elimach and Rabbi Mordechai. Rabbi Mordechai was reluctant. He said, I want to come closer to Hashem. But the way I want to get there is by denying this, uh, these physical pleasures. And not only that, hurting myself. Um, and, and so but Rav Elimelech was encouraging an embrace of physical pleasures. So this tension between the physical, the, the proper way to come to a, a, a union with Hashem Yisbarach, to have a better relationship with Hashem Yisbarach, is not only found in early Hasidism like Rav Elimelech, it's found throughout much of Jewish history, and it's found in, drum roll please, it's found in the Daf Yomi for, for Kol Nidre night. The Daf Yomi for Erev Yom Kippur sees this exact tension. So we are going to just study a little bit from the Daf Yomi for Kol Nidre night, where it talks about this tension between how is the, what is the best way to come to Hashem through physical pleasures or limitation of it. So it says the Gemara, this is Gemara in Beitza, Tes Vav Amabez. The Gemara tells us the following story. It says the Gemara, Tanara, and it's a very, very, on one hand, simple story, on the other hand, very difficult story to understand. We're going to learn this Gemara, those of you who want to learn it. Uh, it's Beitza 15b. Somebody could share the, the link in the, in the, in the chat, it's, it's Beitza 15b. The Gemara says as follows, there was a story, and the story found in the early source from the Brisa. The story says, Maisa the Rabbi Eliezer, there's an incident with Rabbi Eliezer, the Tana Rabbi Eliezer, Shaya Yoshe Vidorish Koyom Kuo. He's sitting there and he's teaching Torah. He's teaching Torah. Can you imagine what a merit it must have been to learn Torah from the holy Rabbi Eliezer? Can you imagine? Can't even imagine how holy that must have been to sit there studying Torah from the great sage. And what day was it? It was Yontif. It was Yontif. We're gonna, we know it was Yontif from the context. And he was going on and on. Sometimes rabbis do that. And we'll get back to that later on, whether or not it's appropriate. I'm going to say something here at the end. Or I'm warning you now. Controversial. I'm going to say something very controversial, which actually I learned from my son, Max. He told it to me. So, uh, so Doresh Kol Yom Kul Behilchas Yom Tov. He was talking all about the laws of Yom Tov. Yatzda Kas So there was a group there of students that got up in the middle and left. Sometimes this happens, even to the greatest rabbis, the greatest teachers. They got up and left. And what did they do? We know from the context, the assumption is that they got up to uh, go and and say, we're out of here. We have to go eat Yantif meal. We have, a, we have a meal waiting. We have guests. We got to go home. So he said, he looks at them, Rabbi Eliezer looks at them and he says, Hello, Bale Pisatin. These people have very big barrels of wine in their home and they prepared it, meaning to say they're, they're it's, it's not 100% clear what he means. If he means this in a derogatory manner, in a positive manner, but the, the assumption the assumption is of Rashi that he means in a derogatory manner, that they're gluttonous, that they don't want to engage in the Torah study. 
Pashnias, and then he kept on talking. He kept on talking. By the way, if anybody needs to leave the Zoom in the middle today, go for it. I'm not going to be upset at all. It's a pleasure. Whatever time we study together is a pleasure. You could change a name on your Zoom link, and I won't even know it's you, and then turn the camera off. Okay, so uh, so the second group got up to go, and he says, hello, Bale Chavios. He says, this group, they've got barrels, not as large as the other people who are called the Bale Pitasin, but they've got these smaller barrels, and so therefore, they stayed a little bit longer. But nevertheless, they're no good. Kashlishis, he kept talking. The third group got up and he said, Hello, Bale Kadin. Oh, he says, these people, they have just like jugs of jugs of wine in their house. And these are much smaller. And he was uh, disappointed in them too. Kasravias, then the fourth group gets up to leave. <laughs> and he says, Hello, Bale Laginin. He says, these people have small, like small little dishes. That's all. They keep their wine in smaller dishes. Comes along the fifth group to leave, and he says, Hello, Bale Kosos. These guys just have cups in their house. That's why they're leaving latest. So he was very upset with all of them, presumably. At least Rashi's interpretation is. His Chilukashi Shislat says, This sixth group got up to go. Amar, Hello, Bale Meira. So this too is a controversial statement. He says, These people are worthy to be cursed. Um, so why was he so upset with these people? So Rashi says, Rashi says the reason is because when they were getting up, the, this group, I'll read the Rashi, now the base metrics was going to be very empty. And he's like talking to almost empty room. You know, he's like, there's two people, you know, like very few people left. And he's like, can you imagine? We've all been there, right? We've all been there. Unfortunately, I hope not too many times of people attending my class, but it's, it happens to all, to all of us and by all of us. And, and, and these people are leaving and he was very upset with them. He was very upset with them. Nasan Eina of Betalmidim. This is a very important phrase. He put, he put his eyes on his students. And their faces began to change. They began, they were, they were afraid. They were afraid. So, we have to come back to this in a moment. First, I'll finish the story. What does it mean he put his eyes on them and why were they afraid? So he said, He said, no, my children, I'm not upset with you. I'm upset at these other people who left. Why? And this is the phrase that sticks with me. This is this is the phrase that I that to me is just like jumps out of me and something we have to always remember. These people who left, what are they doing? What are they doing? They're leaving this world, the eternal life, and they're engaging in the temporary life. That's what they're doing. They left the Torah study. They left the eternal life. And what are they doing? They're engaging in the temporary study. We'll come back to this in a moment. Bishas Petirasan, when, when these students had to leave, I guess after his Torah class, Amr Lam Rabbi Eliezer said, just like Ezra the scribe said to the Jewish people on Rosh Hashanah in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, when they left, he said to them, you know what? Go eat your fats and drink your drink your sweet drinks. Send your gifts. Today is holy to our God. Don't be sad that you're doing this. Because the delight of God is in your splendor or in your strength. Or whatever. The Gemara is going to discuss exactly what that means. But when the third, last group left that study Torah, he blessed them. He blessed them. So before we talk about this powerful story, to me, the story had a big impact on me. When I was... When I was uh, looking over Gemara Beitz uh, a few weeks ago, try to look, I try to look over the Masechta in advance because we do the Daf Yomi and I, I want to be prepared. And this story just really, just really connected. But first, I want to see what does it mean he put his eyes on them and why were they afraid? So Rashi says, Rashi says, why did he put his eyes on them? Why were they afraid? So Rashi says they were afraid because they thought 
Check this out. Check what Rashi says. Kisvurim, they thought shekoes al kas shishis imnesha achro atzeis v'kol shekayin aleinu. Rashi says they thought that their teacher was upset at the sixth group that was late in leaving, and for sure he's going to be upset at us. Whoa! I mean, that's like the opposite of what I had initially presented. Let's. He wasn't upset. He was upset that they should have left earlier. That's what Rashi says. Rashi saying that, while well, he's saying that the sixth group should have left earlier to go home and be with their families. And we should have left earlier also. That's why he's upset with us. Everybody following this? You following this? Like why, why was Rashi, why Rashi saying, why was Rebbe Eliezer placing his eyes on the sixth group? They thought, that he was that they thought he was upset with them for not leaving his class in the middle and, and going home and having their yantif meal. Now, this is this is very this is very difficult, Rashi, to understand because at least for me, and it's not just for me, the commentaries like Rabbi Yitzhak Abu Hab, they, they say, What are you talking about? How can any student think that their teacher would be upset with them for studying Torah? And, and not leaving the class. Uh, it, the Gemara talks about elsewhere, the Gemara mentions twice in Chas that there's two times you're supposed to, they close down the base measures, the night of Yom Kippur, okay, Kol Nidre night, they say go home and, and go to shul, and also the night of Pesach. But other than that, the Gemara says, never close the base measures. So, so why would they have thought that that was a reason to be upset? And can you imagine any teacher who would be upset that, it's, that their student, his or her students, want to stay and study Torah? It's not, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So therefore, Marsha offers an alternative suggestion. What does Marsha say? Marsha is the 15th century, the great 15th century commentary. He says that this, what does it mean that he placed his eyes upon them? It means that they were worried that their Rebbe, Rebbe Eliezer, was suspecting them of also wanting to leave the class. So they thought, okay, now he's upset with us because like, you know, it's the old joke. They see the person looking for, looking under a light bulb in the, you know, under a lamppost outside in the dark. And they said, what are you doing? He said, I, I dropped the dollar. And they said, why are, where'd you drop the dollar? He said, I dropped it down the block. So he said, so why are you looking under the lamp? He said, well, that's where the light is. So where is he going to look? That's where the light is. So Rabbi Eliezer, who's he going to be upset at? He's only going to be upset at the person who's there. He can't be upset at the person who left. So they thought that he was upset at them because they thought he was going to leave, like the teacher was in a really bad mood. But they misunderstood it because as some of the commentaries say that Nasan Eina Betamidim could mean he placed his eyes upon them. Bechiba, Rabbi Nuchanan uses his term, with love. He was so happy that they were studying with him. So he placed his eyes upon them with such great love that that's what it meant. And they stayed in the class to study Torah with him. So that's how we understand that difficult phrase that, that, that Marsha is saying, really, they misunderstood. They thought they were feeling guilty, but really their teacher was embracing them for studying Torah with him. And some, you know, as somebody who, uh, who has been inspired every day during COVID, by the people who study Torah with me, who come on and study Torah, make a point of studying Torah every day, I could tell you that it's incredibly inspiring uh, as a teacher to see dedicated students who are so dedicated to Torah study. And in time we studied outside in the freezing cold and there were dedicated students studying and we, stu we studied late at night, like right now, and there are dedicated students, dedicated people, and we're all students of Torah studying Torah or early in the morning. It is incredibly inspiring. And so I, I, would, I, I just want to point that out. That for me personally, it's been an incredibly inspiring time of studying Torah. So thank you. So the Talmud then, going back to our story, raises another basic question about this story. Why was Rebbe Eliezer criticizing his students, rebuking his students for going to eat their yantif meals, to going to eat their holiday meals, when it's considered a mitzvah to celebrate on the festival. It's a mitzvah. There's a mitzvah of you have to rejoice on your festival. You're supposed to eat a yantif meal. 
Some say you have to eat meat, but you don't have to. You have to eat what the food you enjoy, the food you enjoy, wine, if you like wine. You have to celebrate the holiday meal. So why was Rabbi Eliezer yelling at his students or mocking them or criticizing them when they were doing a mitzvah? They were doing a mitzvah. So the Talmud therefore takes this story and continues and, and connects it to a fundamental dispute. The fundamental dispute which is the proper way to celebrate a holiday. And actually, it's not just about the proper way to celebrate a holiday, it's really about the proper way to be a Jew, the proper way to be a Jew. So that's the continuation of the Talmud. The Talmud says as follows, Amar Mar, so we learned this, and this Gemara also appeared in several places, in two places in Shas, that Rebbe Yezer, we were so upset. He was so upset at these people that they abandoned this world, the eternal life, and they engaged in the temporary, the temporary, temporary life, momentary life. Mar says, well, Simchas Yom Tov Mitzvah. But rejoicing on the festival is a great mitzvah. Why is he getting upset at them? Says the Gemara. This it brings us into a fundamental dispute between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua. Fundamental dispute about how we should live our life. Rabbi Eliezer Tamei, the Amar Simchas Yom Tov Roshus. Rabbi Eliezer goes according to his opinion that says, you're actually not required to be joyous on the festival. It's just discretionary, it's optional. As it says, Rabbi Eliezer taught, Ein lo adam the Yom Tov. Person can do on Yantif either Ochal Vishose or Yoshe Vishone. Person has an option. You have the discretion on Yantif. You could either spend the whole day on Yantif sitting and studying Torah or eating and drinking. That's all. You don't have to do both. You can just spend the whole day studying Torah or the whole day eating or drinking. But Rabbi Yoshua comes along and says, Chalkeyo. You have, to, you have to take this day, take this whole Yantif day, and divide it in half. Chatzio Hashem, the Chatzio Achem. Take the whole Yantif day, divide it in half. Half is for God, and half is for you. That's the fundamental dispute between Rabbi Yezer and Rabbi Yoshua. Again, I'll just repeat it. Rabbi Yezer says you could spend the whole day either drinking and eating or else studying Torah. Whereas Rabbi Yeshua says, no, you have to divide the day in half. Spend half the day studying Torah and half the day, half the day eating and drinking. Half the day is for you. Half the day is for God. And half the day is for you. So, so according to Rabbi Eliezer, we're going to spend just a little bit on Rabbi Eliezer's position, but then we'll move on from him. For, for the reason that Rabbi Eliezer's position is not accepted as halacha. As halacha is universally rejected in this case. But we should at least understand where he's coming from. Rabbi Eliezer, who says the entire day is either eating and drinking or else studying Torah, you have to do one of, one of the two things. So how do we understand it? So again, Rabbi Yitzhak Abuab explains that since there are some people who only enjoy Torah study. There's some people who don't like eating or drinking. They just don't like it. Going back to Rav Morchai Bennett at the beginning, some people get pleasure out of denying pleasure to themselves. So they don't get pleasure out of eating or drinking. That to them is not an enjoyable activity. So those people, they're, they're, therefore the Torah gives us permission to celebrate the holiday in whatever we deem most pleasurable. Meaning to say, is it most pleasurable? to study Torah, or is it more pleasurable to eat or drink? And we could do whichever we want we want. So, so Rabbi Yaakov Anden explains that, that Rabbi Eliezer is saying you're not required to divide the day. You'd be allowed to divide the day if you want. But others say, for example, Marsha says, no, he says that Rabbi Eliezer fundamentally believes it's not possible to do both. You can't possibly spend half your day studying Torah and half your day eating and drinking. He doesn't believe it's possible. So that, that's just like a, a tangent as to try to understand what Rabbi Eliezer's position is. But I want to note uh, that really we should follow, we should spend more time on Rabbi Yeshua because Rabbi Yeshua's position is the halachic, the way the Shulchan Aruch rules. We'll read it in a moment. 
it's also actually, according to the Iyun Yaakov, Rabbi Eliezer himself abandoned his position and accepts Rabbi Yeshua's position, that a person has to spend half of his day on the holiday uh, for himself and the other half for God. And what does this mean? What does this mean? Uh, and by the way, should, should we, the Ian Yaakov also notes that the reason why the Talmud says at the beginning of the story, Mai said this is a one-time thing. Once Rabbi Lezer saw all the students leaving, he realized, you know, this is not working, and he changed himself after that. This is a one-time incident. He gave it up. He stopped after that. He learned from his ways. So this is how Rambam describes the proper way to observe a holiday. The Rambam says this in laws at Hilchel Shvisas Yom Tov. He says, even, I'm just going to read it in the English, he says, even though eating and drinking are included in the mitzvahs say uh, the positive commandment of joy on the holiday, still one should not drink and, and eat the, the whole day. You shouldn't spend your whole day eating and drinking. Rather, this is the appropriate measure. This is what the Rambam says. This is what the Rambam says. All of the people get up early in the morning to go to the synagogues and study alls to pray and to read in the Torah about the topic of the day. Then they go back home, eat, and go to the study hall where they read and study until midday. And after midday, they pray the afternoon prayers, return to their homes to eat and drink for the rest of the day until night. So basically, Ramam is following the position of Rabbi Yoshua that one should divide our festival between chatzil Hashem, chatzil Hashem, between Torah study and eating, between Torah study and eating. And indeed, the Shulchan Aruch rules this way explicitly in our Chaim, in, in Simon, Taf, Kuf, Taf, Kuf, Chav, Tes, or Shulchan Aruch rules. It is a mitzvah from the Torah to spend half of the day, half the time in the house of study, in the base medrash, and half of the time eating and drinking. So there are two major implications of this position of Rabbi Yoshua, which by the way, I think everybody is guilty of, everybody uh, across the world. So, so I guess they are aspirational rather than exact, but still we should know what we should aspire for. And if we can't live up to it, we at least know what we should try to do the best we can. So the first implication is that a community should not be detained more than is necessary in a synagogue on Shabbat and holidays, that the community should not be detained. The services should not be too long. It should not be excessive. This is a big problem in the, uh, it, was a, it was a much bigger problem before COVID came, but it's a big problem in the, in the Orthodox Jewish communities that the services are too long because we kept adding stuff to them and we never took anything out. And then the services became longer and longer. And there needs to be time on these holy days for the community to go home and celebrate the day with food and drink. There's, to my mind, if somebody was creating an ideal service today, nobody would ever make a service that's two and a half hours long. It's just who would ever do that? It just doesn't make sense. It's just not, you, it's hard to concentrate. We don't do anything for two and a half hours straight. It's, it's too long. So during, during COVID, we closed this, you know, we, we streamlined the service and it made it much quicker. And now it's like an hour and a half. And it's, I think people can have more kavana. I've noticed that there's less talking during services, that people are more focused during the prayers, the service. But this is also, it's against halacha. To, to keep people too long, and then you can't spend the time eating and drinking on Shabbat and Chag. And the Mishnah Brewer writes, this is the, this is the line from the Mishnah Brewer, on this halacha, the Chafetz Chaim, he says, go Rebo, we rebuke those chazanim, those cantors, that detain people in synagogue for more than half the day. And that's what the Mishnah Brewer says. We rebuke those cantors that to pay, detain people in the synagogue for more than half the day. So, so therefore, on the basis of Rabbi Yoshua's position, Rabbi Yitzhak Zilberstein rules. So there's, there's a question that Rabbi Yitzhak Zilberstein, I saw this because my son Max said to me, you know, like a couple of weeks ago, he said, well, we no longer, you know, like we used to have the Devar Torah and the Shul on Shabbos morning. And, and he said like, 
but then you have it's not fair to keep people prisoner you know you should let people come back if they want to study and that's what he said to me you know he was saying it very respectfully obviously so this was a question that uh, you know like what's the proper way you want you don't want to force people to go but on the other end you want to teach torah so this was a question that was brought to rabbi zilberstein and rabbi zilberstein the cheshuke chamed and and the rabbi asked him this was an actual incident he said the people aren't studying torah so I, I want to make them, before they go home, before they go downstairs to the Kiddush, I want to give the Torah class and then let them go. That way we can get them to study the Torah. So, so and obviously Rabbi Zilberstein devotes his whole life to studying Torah. So this is what he writes. This is what he writes. I, I, if I wrote this, then they would throw me out of whatever rabbinical assembly I'm still in, which I don't know what it is. But if I wrote this, they would kick me out. But Rabbi Zilberstein, you know, his brother-in-law is Rabbi Chaim Kinevsky, his father-in-law is Rabbi Yashiv. I mean, this is the, the blue blood of Torah scholarship. And this is what he writes. He writes that the Ramah writes, okay, so let me just say this, that outside the land of Israel in the Ashkenazi communities, the practice is not to give a priestly blessing in outside the land of Israel. The Birkat Kohanim every day is only given on the festivals, but not every day in Israel. They give it every day. They do it every day. So, so the Ramah writes that outside the land of Israel, even on a festival, the Kohanim only bless the congregation at Musaf. So why do they only do it at Musaf? Why not in the morning at Shacharit? Why not in the earlier part of the service? Why the later part of the service? So he says the reason is, Ramah writes, the reason is because the Birka Kohanim need to be given at a time of great joy. We want to give it when people are happy. And so therefore, it's offered when people are about ready to leave the service because they're happy because they're going home to eat. That's what he says. We want to do it when they're going home to eat and celebrate the holiday. That's what he says. That's what uh, Ramah writes. We want to, you can only do it when people are happy. We see from this ruling of the Ramah, writes Rabbi Zilberstein, and it is not appropriate to delay the congregation that wants to go home in order to celebrate the holiday. If the congregation wants to go home, it's not appropriate to delay them. And so too on Shabbat. And so therefore, he writes, it is the rabbi's responsibility to find an appropriate time for the community to study and entice them with sweet words to return to synagogue later in the day. Like the Obavitcher Rebbe, I know that he didn't, he didn't give a he, he invited people back in the afternoon. And everybody came back then and he gave like an hour long uh, uh, drasha on, on Shabbos. So, uh, he, so that was, it's not only one model of teaching Torah, like a sermon on Shabbos morning during the uh, sermon slot of a synagogue. There are other times where people would come back or on Moti Shabbos, people come from Moab Malkavi or Shir for an hour to study Torah together. So that's what Rabbi Zilberstein said. He said, no, the people want to go home. Don't force them. Don't say you can't leave because you're not going to come back. No, it's your job to try to get them to come back. You know, every community has to find the sweet spot that works for them. But his point was, his point was, chatzi lachem, half for you means you can't keep people prisoners in synagogues. Okay, so everybody is comfortable with that. But guess what? There's another part to this phrase. You know what the other part to this phrase is? Chatzi Hashem. We have to do half for Hashem. What does half for Hashem mean? It means that the community must be spending a significant portion of our holy days in the study of Torah. That's what it means. Yes, we know half for us. We know we like to go home and eat. Who doesn't like to spend time with their friends and their family? Yes, but Chatzi Hashem, the halacha is. You're supposed to spend half of your holy day in the study of Torah. Okay, now, now for everybody, it's not possible. I know people have little kids. It's not possible. But we have to spend a significant portion of time, a serious portion of time, every, every holiday, Chatzil Hashem, designated to God through Torah study. And we should be carving out on our holy days a significant portion of time for the study of Torah. That's the clear halacha. That's the clear implication of this teaching. And to not do so is a violation of a clear teaching of the Talmud and of halacha of Jewish law. To say, I'm going to spend an entire holy day without opening up a book of Torah and studying is a violation 
of, of Jewish law. And not only that, to not do that is a negation of what it means to be a part of a spiritual community. Being part of a spiritual community means that it's a constant effort to improve ourselves through Torah study. If you, if you want to say we have a spiritual community without Torah study, then, then it's a denial, it's an existential component of what it means to be part of a Jewish community. And more than that, for us to not make Torah study central to our individual and communal life, and this is the, the most important thing to my mind, it's, it's very important to not be in violation of Jewish law, but the most important thing is if we don't make Torah study central to our communal and individual life, it's to miss out on something that can enhance our life, enhance our life tremendously and bring incredible meaning to our life. It is so sad. It is so sad if we don't give ourselves that opportunity. So you know, I always, I know I sound like a broken record. I sound like a broken record sometimes when I encourage people to, uh, to join us for Torah study. But recently a friend of mine who I encouraged to join us for Torah study and he completed the tractate sukkah and he joined it. Now we're in Beitza, we're on page 15 in Beitza, and, and he completed Sukkah. Everybody's welcome to join. There are, everybody is welcome to join, and it might be hard and challenging, but the Lefum Tsara Agra, according to the pain, is the reward, and nothing nothing good is easy in life. And so uh, when we finished to see him for Tractate Sukkah, he shared with me that this extra half hour a day that he committed every single day to Torah study enhanced his life in an incredibly meaningful way. That's what he said. As a person who's very busy, just we're all very busy, but I'm saying like, that if we don't give ourselves a chance, we're, 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 we're really just hurting ourselves. That's the point. We have this, the Torah, the Torah is a spice. The Torah gives us, Hashem gives us this spice, this tablet of Chaim, the spice of life as our heritage, not an inheritance, as our heritage, that's something that's incredibly meaningful. And if we don't take advantage of that opportunity, I promise all of us that it's the people, the ones who are hurt are us because we're gonna wake up and, and feel the emptiness. So before it, gets, before it gets to that point, we should invest in ourselves by taking the time every day especially on the holy days where we don't have work, we're not allowed to work. But every day, taking the time for Torah study, the biggest beneficiary will be ourselves. Our lives will be enhanced through incredible meaning. The Torah study is, you know, if there was a pill that you could take every day that would make us feel great, that would just like change the way we feel about the world, change, you know, give us like an upper in life and make us, make us happy and focused and uplifted, we would all say, where do I get that pill? That pill is the Torah. That pill is the Torah that if we ingest the Torah every single day of our life, I guarantee you, it's not about the daf, it's about the yomi. It's about every day. If we ingest every day, we take aside a half hour of Torah, uh, our lives will be changed. Our lives will be changed for the better. And to those who say, I don't have time for daily Torah study, I would argue back that daily Torah study will make you either a better husband, a better wife, a better father, a better mother, a better son, a better daughter, a better person, a better human being, that the more we invest in it, it's like seeing the whole world in color as opposed to seeing the world in black and white. The more we study Torah, our life will be enhanced. Now, on a holiday, it's a mitzvah from the Torah to rejoice in the holiday. And so how can Rabbi Eliezer then say, and one should spend the entire day immersed in Torah study, if it's a mitzvah from the Torah to rejoice, the obvious answer to this question is that when the Torah becomes central to our life, there's nothing more enjoyable, nothing more special, nothing more uplifting than Torah study, nothing more exhilarating than Torah study. And Torah study will not only bring immense joy in the moment, like if you bite a piece of chocolate cake, ah, geschmack, yeah, but then it passes two seconds later, right? Then we just stuck with the chocolate cake forever, right? Or whatever. But the Torah study, we take the bite out of it and we have it forever. We have that pleasure lasting with us, lifting us up forever and ever. Her whole life will be suffused with purpose and with meaning. I want to share with you, I said uh, at the beginning, I said a story that they say about Rabbi Melech. Here's another story that they say about Rabbi Melech. I can't promise you that the story is 100% true. But this is the story they say about my holy ancestor, the holy Rebelli Melech. 
The story is as follows. That one time, Rabbi Elimelech became very sick. He became very sick, and we say that the Hasidim were davening outside his, outside his room day and night for a few days. And then after a few days, Rabbi Elimelech awoke in a, in a tremendous, tremendous sweat, and, uh, and he awoke from his state of unconsciousness. And when the Rebbe awoke, he said to the Hasidim, let me share with you, let me share with you what I saw when I was gone. You, where was I? You thought I was here. I wasn't here. My body was here, but my neshama was up in the Shemayim. Again, I can't promise you it's true, but this is what the story that they say Rebellion Mel said. He said, my neshama was up in Shemayim. And what was I doing up in Shemayim? I was wandering the streets of heaven. I was wandering the streets of heaven. When I came across a great rabbi, who was this great rabbi? Rev Avram Azulai. And I came across this great rabbi, Rev Avram Azulai, and he walked with me and we enjoyed the great breeze in Shemayim. Can you imagine what a breeze in Shemayim feels like? Oh, a geshmaka breeze, right? The, 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 you're feeling heaven like we sometimes have a breeze. That's the breeze, the breeze of Shemayim. So Rabbi Azulai turned to me and he said, while we were walking, he says, here in Shemayim, you know what the big buzz is? The skull bud in Shemayim? Everybody's talking about you and your holy brother, Rabzusha. Everybody wants to know. Tell me about like this Torah that you and Rabzusha, your brother, are promoting. Here in heaven, that's what everyone's talking about. The heavens are in awe of Rabzusha's words. Rabzusha never wrote a book, by the way. He did write the Haskama to the Tanya. He wrote the uh, uh, the the opening like uh, approbation for the Tanya. There were only two, I think two people who wrote Haskamos to the Tanya. One is Reb Zusha. He says, and they just built. So anyway, Rabbi Zua says, here in heaven, they built a huge base medrash for all the followers of your brother's teachings to sit and study. So Rabbi, Z Rabbi Zulai and Rabbi Elimelech were continuing to walk. And they came to a beautiful garden, which had these flowers had a divine, holy smell to them. So they listened to the conversations of the angels as they strolled amongst the flowers. And then they came to a clearing with a beautiful base medrash, a beautiful, a beautiful building, a towering and exalted base medrash. And Rabbi Zulai said, look at this beautiful building. You know what it is? This is where Rav Shmelka, our old friend from the beginning of our studies today, this is where Rav Shmelka of Nicholsburg He's sitting and studying Torah in his yeshiva with his students up in this base, Medrash and Shemayim. A few weeks ago, Rashmelka came up to us. He established a yeshiva. And now many souls come from, come from the world below to attend his yeshiva. I guess we could say, we're not sure that we want that yeshiva to grow because it means that people are dying, but that's what was happening. The people were leaving the world below. They're going to study in Rav Shmelka's yeshiva. So Rabbi Mel says, well, this is my friend Rav Shmelka. I'm gonna go see. <clears throat> I'm gonna go see my friend Reb Shmelka. So he says, I'm gonna go into the yeshiva. So Reb Elimelch tries to go to the yeshiva, and as he comes to the entrance to the base medrash, he sees there at the entrance a man he recognizes from Lezhensk. Reb Elimelch was from Lezhensk, and he recognizes in Lezhensk there was a man named Mordechai. Mordechai, Mordechai, the bookbinder of Lezhensk. His job it was a menial job. He'd take the books and bind them together. So he says, oh my gosh, I didn't know you were up here, Mordechai. I'm here and you're here. Wow, we're here together. I didn't know you were here, Mordechai. And so he said, he said to him, Mordechai looks at him, he says, Psh, Rebeli Melech, if the angels heard you calling me Mordechai and not Reb Mordechai, oh yeah, yeah, you'd be in big trouble. Here, you got to call me Reb Mordechai or else you're going to get in trouble. Like I said, I don't know if the story is actually exactly the way it happened, but this is how the Hasidim tell it. So he says, here, you got to call me Reb Mordechai. He says, what? What happened? He says, I'll tell you the story. The story is like this. He said, what happened was I came up to Shemayim. And after I came up to Shemayim, they brought me to the heavenly court. And they brought me to the heavenly court. And then when I was in the heavenly court, what happened? They, they, they had a scale. And on one side of the scale, they would put my good deeds. And the other side of the scale, they would put my bad deeds. And they started weighing things down. Excuse me. And, and guess what happened? After a while, they, the side of the scale, not proud of this, which had my big bad deeds, outweighed the side that has the good deeds. And they said, that's it. And they gave a ruling. And the ruling was, 
I was off to Gehenna. That's the ruling that they gave to me. I was off to Gehenna. Gehenna, don't know exactly what it was, but it didn't sound good. So he says, I started the long walk down to Gehenna and it was getting very hot and hotter and hotter and hotter. And I came to the entrance to Gehenna. And I came to the entrance to Gehenna. And as I was about to enter into Gehenna, suddenly as I'm walking into the gates of Gehenna, boom, I get grabbed by two malachim, two angels who are officers of the court. And they seized me and they said, you were summoned back to the heavenly court. An appeal was made. There's a malach, there's an angel. This angel is known as the malach al hadaf. Daf, the daf, the daf yomi. This is the angel, is the malach al hadaf. He's the angel over the daf, the angel over the page. Why? This angel, well, well, we'll tell you about him. What happened was that the angel got up and said, you know, this Reb Mordechai, this Mordechai, you didn't count all his good deeds because whenever he saw a, a book that had a loose piece of paper in it, he didn't throw the book out. He would collect the loose pieces of paper and put them in a bag and he treated them properly. He wasn't a learned man. He didn't know what was contained in the books, but he felt the holiness of the books and he started collecting them in bags and he put them in his attic. And I want to bring those pages that he preserved and he saved and I want to show them to you. And so as, as Mordechai was walking back from Gehenna, they saw wagons coming with his sacks and all the pages and they started putting the, the sacks on top of the scale. And the next thing you know, his scale was clearly on the side of the merit and the heavenly court reversed itself and said, Mordechai, you're a tzaddik, no longer Rem Mordechai, you're no longer Mordechai, you're now Rem Mordechai, you go into heaven. And so he said, so I was decreed as Rem Mordechai, but there's only one problem. Well, it's heaven. Heaven is a yeshiva. I have to sit and study Torah, but I didn't know anything. I don't know even know how to read a book. So I didn't know what to do. So I can't just go into the yeshiva. So the angel said, don't worry, we'll help you. And the angel started teaching me Torah. And he said, I started studying Torah. And at first it was very, very hard. And it was going very, very slowly. Very hard, very, but, I, but I didn't give up. I didn't give up at the first sign of trouble. I didn't even give up at the second sign, the third sign, because I have time, I have time, I'm up in heaven. And so I was studying Torah and I was being, and every day bet more and more and more. And now they told me I'm allowed to go into the base medrash of Rav Shmelka. So now I'm gonna go into the base medrash of Rav Shmelka because now, even though I understood nothing at first. Now I know. Now I know. So Rav Eli Mel watched with his mouth, his jaw on the ground, as Rav Mordechai was now walking into the base medrash of Rav Shmelka, and he opened the doors, and he confidently walked in. And Rav Eli Melch said, he's going in, I'm going in too. And Rav Eli started rushing after, after him into the base medrash, and he came to the gates, and right then the gates locked and Rebelli Mel starts screaming, so open the gates, open the gates, open the gates. And just then he woke up in this sweat. He woke up from his, I guess his time in heaven. He returned to earth and he said, as I screamed louder and louder, I woke up in my bed covered in sweat. So again, I, you know, I'm not a hundred percent certain that the story is exactly the way it happened in heaven, but of course that's not the point. The point is, this year, as our year begins, 5782, we must ask ourselves as Jews the following questions. What's our question? Is Torah study a central part of our life? And if the answer is that it is not, then the next question should be, how can we improve in this area? How can we add more Torah to our life? How can we do better? How can we do better? Because Torah is the gift that Hashem has given us. And if this gift is appreciated, then this gift will change our lives forever. The Talmud in Kedushin tells us, it says, Vesamtem, you shall place these words of mine in your heart. Read it, read it as Vesam Tom, a perfect drug. Torah is the perfect drug. It's the Samachayim, it's the drug of life. So there's a mushal, says the Gemara and Kedushin. There's a parable 
So a person, Rahman al he, he he hit someone, he hit his son, and his son, he put a bandage on his wound. And his son said to him, and he said to him, my son, as long as this bandage is on your wound and is healing you, eat what you enjoy, drink what you enjoy, bathe in whatever type of liquid you want, hot water or cold, and you don't need to be afraid because this bandage will heal your wound. But if you take it off, if you take off this bandage, then the wound will become, it will become very infected. It will become infected and it'll become very life-threatening. And so too, Hashem Yisbarach said to the Jewish people, I created a Yetzir Hara in this world. I created an evil inclination. And this is the wound. And I created Torah as the Psalm, as the antidote to the forces in this world that try to take us off of the right path. And if you are engaged in Torah study, that you will not be given over to go down the wrong path. If you do well, if we commit to Torah study, we will be lifted up. We will have the focus in our lives that we need to live a life of tremendous meaning, of inspiration, of joy, of blessing, of commitment to others, of giving, of growth, every single day of our life to our last breath. Our life will be suffused with tremendous meaning. People who study Torah, as they're dying, their words are words of Torah as they're dying, as they're living their words of Torah, as they're dying, because it all makes sense. It all makes sense. So what I want to say to everybody, I, I don't know how much longer I'll be able to share direct messages with everybody here. So what I want to say to everybody, if I can say one thing to you, one piece of advice, one blessing, one guidance, what would I tell you? And I tell you very, very simply, add Torah study to your life. If you're doing nothing, Add 15 minutes. If you're doing a half hour, add 45. Add, make every, Each one of us has to say, as we begin 5782, how can we grow in Torah study? Because it is a matter for us of bringing great meaning into our life, no matter where we are. That's my blessing to you, my bracha to you. And this year of 5782, let us make it a year where we can study Torah together. Shana Tova, my friend. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Yes, I'll be hanging out here. People have questions. Shmuel.